Hello everyone, and welcome to a video on the Constructor Criticism YouTube channel. I'm Spencer, host of Constructor Criticism, and limited time only. Two podcasts about getting better at Match Togethering. And today, as Mason promised, I am here to talk to you about a snake deck. So for those who don't know, I'm a big fan of snake decks. Uh, got some pro points at the last GP Denver. Um, just barely missing outside of cash. Uh, won multiple PVDQs with the deck. And I, I just really love playing snake decks. And one of the things that I've been doing a lot is been playing a ton of team or energy, a lot of four color energy, some of four color Hinderocker slash four color Jabberwocky. And I, I just been playing a ton of different mid range decks. And something that I noticed uh, in playing those mid range decks is two things. The first thing is uh, the, when you lose games, it's typically to one of two things that are in the same vein. One is you're losing to your mana. And two, you're losing because you don't curve out. And so I wanted to build a deck or try to build a deck that has the best chance of doing either of those things. So I've landed on this energy, this not energy deck. Uh, I mean, it is an energy deck, but I've landed on this snake deck. And I played a ton of Sultai uh, earlier this year and found certain things I liked about it. And as I was as I was playing, thinking about going back to Soul Time, like why am I playing blue? And is the really the question for me was is the island worth it? Because I think that the dual lands don't really hurt you that much, but I think that the island in a deck playing Winding Constrictor often does hurt you because it really does hurt your curve out potential. So I went back to green black energy and uh, four one to league and then uh, three two to another league. Uh, and uh, made some changes, and I'm I'm pretty happy with where the deck is at. Uh, and then, and I I'd like to talk about it really quick. So let's go over the deck list. So we have three Bristling Hydra. So this is something that I think that I really liked in my version of Team Energy. If you watched my previous deck tech, I talked about Bristling Hydra and how good Bristling Hydra is in this deck in the Energy Mirror. Um, and nothing's changed here. I think that Bristling Hydra is a great inclusion. It's something that your Bristling Hydra outpaces their Bristling Hydra when you have a snake in play very easily. Um, and you can easily get a ton of energy and make it so that they either have to trade unfairly or, uh, or unfavorably, I should say, or get you to the point where you can just sit there and amass a group of energy while you're trying to move forward in your game plan. We have four Glint Sleeve Siphoner. This is something that in very early versions of Green Black Energy that I didn't like, but as I played more with the deck, I've understood the importance of this card. So I've tried things like Merfolk Branch Walker in this plot and things like that. And the, the, if there's one thing that the, that the Soul Tide deck really taught me, it's that this card allows you to out card advantage the decks that Okay, let me let me start with this way. You have the best two drops in your deck. So between Glen City Siphoner, Long Disc Up, and Winding Constrictor, all of your two drops are impactful. So because of that, your curve out potential is much higher. And Glen Seaf Siphoner allows you to draw more cards, and because your two drops are so impactful, you you get a double spell early, and you have a higher chance of double spelling because you get to draw extra cards. Speaking of which, we have Long Disc Up. This deck is the deck that wants to draw Long Cup, Tusk Cub, I, I wouldn't say the most. That's probably not true. But it does like drawing Long Tusk Cub as much as Teamer does. The thing is, is that uh, this this is the deck that Long Tusk Cub gets the most out of hand with. So it's the one that Long Tusk Cub gets the most free wins with. Because of Winding Constrictor's ability to get extra energy as well as put extra counters on it, it, it is more likely to run away with game in this deck than any other deck. And I think that diluting your mana with blue mana was a disservice to Long Tusk Cub and the Winding Constrictor synergy. And I don't think that you were ever meant to try and jam in your Hostage Takers and Rogue Refiners. I think that between Glint Sleeve Siphoner, Winding Constrictor, and... and uh, you know, a tune with Ether, and even things like Rishkar, it was very easy to make your your Long Tusk Cub big enough to get through and start generating that advantage that on a must deal with threat. Speaking of which, Rishkar is something that I've included three of in this deck. Um, I've played so many versions of this deck with two, and one of the things, like I said earlier, is I want this deck to be a curve out deck. I feel like we are in a standard format where curve 
really matters. And going two drop into Rishkar is just one of the most powerful things you can do because you can follow it up with a Gear Hulk, you can follow it up with a Vraska. There's so many things that you can do because of the ability of Rishkar. Um, it's so funny when I saw this card spoiled, I fell in love with it immediately. I thought I I, I thought it wouldn't be good enough, and I ended I've ended up playing it multiple times, and I'm really happy about the card. I I think that. Um, you, the reason to play three is for game ones and that you sideboard down to two a lot and that's okay i like having a card that i sideboard out one of quite a bit because it makes sideboarding decisions much easier we have two uh sorry three verterous gear hulk this is a recent change for me i was trying two verterous gear hulk two bristling hydra and two rip jar raptors um because of the walking ballista synergies but i don't know that i'm in love with it i think that in a format with a ton like if you know that your opponents are going to be on straight up rug instead of four color energy with with gods, and you know that you're going to play against a lot of Glorybringer, that that style of deck actually does make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, Ripjaw Raptor really does help in those spots. Uh, you get those those walking ballista synergies, and it, it's pretty sweet. But in a format where there's a pretty diverse amount of different styles of energy decks. I think that just curving out is better, and that's for the reason for the, th the three Gear Hulks. We do have three Walking Ballista. I've never liked four of this card. Um, I, you often sideboard out all of them or some of them, so I like a nice round three of them. You want to draw them a little bit um, more often than you would like a one of or a two of. Uh, and for a lot of people, that is a reason to play four, right? Um, but kind of for the similar reasons of Seth Manfield, I think that you like if like this is taking up a removal slot and a two drop slot and because of that because i want to play veracity's contempt i can't actually afford to play four of this card uh we are going to play four winding constrictor though key to the deck um man when i saw this card i thought it was like well, the most overhyped thing and then i'm the one that's playing a ton of it but i really do think this card um is is underrepresented in standard i think that uh right now there is a decrease in abrades. I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing an increase in decks like Pummeler is because abrades kind of on the decline. And when abrade is on the decline, it does make Winding Constrictor better. And because of that, I'm willing to play this deck. Uh, just in case <laughs> we play a bunch of abrades and stuff, we do still have Blossoming Defense. So I have two of these cards. Um, I've been including this card all the way back in the days of uh, Delirium. Uh, huge fan of Blossoming Defense. And what it does for the deck, and when you have so many efficient two drops that are that are a pivotal part of your game plan, I think blossoming defense makes a lot of sense. I had it as a one of back at GP Denver, and with the way that this deck is constructed, with the number of two drops, I think going up to two of them is perfectly reasonable. And for a lot of people that play the team, the Soul Tie version, they're playing all the way up to four, and I don't see a reason to change that. I think that you get to interact on an interesting level as well as close out some games that you might surprise some opponents with so we have four fatal push this is quite important in this deck you have to be able to kill opposing long tusk cubs as well as uh stunt your opponent's mana in their teamer deck with their servant of the conduit uh i do have some evolving wilds in this deck as well as Veraska. so this card does get turned on a little bit more than in some of the other fatal push decks and that's good i think that being able to kill some uh important creatures like Whirler Virtuoso does come up more often than I thought it would in the way that I have the deck built. We have two Veraska's Contempt. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I said this in my last video with Veraska's Contempt, but I'm a little bit surprised at how much I have liked this card. Um, and that's kind of a bad sign if you're a lover of removal spells because they've gotten us to play with a four mana version of Hero's Downfall, makes it, which makes it really unlikely that we'll get Hero's Downfall again. So... I have one Veraska Relic Seeker. I had two of this card, and um, I'm trying out one. I don't know that's correct. So you could easily convince me to cut a Gear Hulk and go back to two Veraska. Um, but I have had multiple hands where I draw both of them in my opener, and those hands actually are really bad. Uh, like, And I've had them enough to the point where I'm willing to only play one. Only because, I, like I said before, I think that the point of this format is to curve out and disrupt your opponent as easily as possible and while Veraska is like one of easily the most powerful cards in standard right now it doesn't fit into that game plan as much as I would want it to we do have four tune with ether this card's great like uh if you want to see a funny meme about this card I think Ali Antrazi tweeted a picture of this card with basically everything that you can get out of two energy and it was really cute 
uh, it, it it really does do a lot of work in the deck and um, enabling your long tusk early, enabling your glint Sea siphoner early is really important. Uh, and I I think that it also enables you to play less lands, uh, which is which is good when you need energy in the stack with things like long tusk cub. I have one die young. I started this as a walk the plank, but uh, shout out to Adrian, one of the listeners of my podcast, mentioned how much he liked die young. Um, and, uh, Mason, our producer also mentioned his love for Dayang, and I've really enjoyed the switch. Uh, it kills most things that you care about pretty easily, as long as you have a winding constrictor in play, while also helping your matchup against Hazorite, which is a card that could be a little bit of trouble for you. We have 22 lands with four Aether Hub, four Blooming Marsh, sorry, four Blooming Marsh, three Evolving Wilds, four Forest, two Hotship Oasis, that's... Something I'm not sure about, but it's for the sideboard. Three If Near Deadlands and two Swamp. So If Near Deadlands has been pretty good. I think that Hotship Oasis is okay because of the sideboard. And it has come up where I've killed people with Glinton Sealy Siphoner because of Hotship Oasis. So that's good. Um, It does hurt your mono red matchup a little bit, but it's okay. You don't actually have very many double black spells. Um, so if near deadlands has actually been pretty good for me, uh, let's go to the sideboard really quick. So where we have two death Watch scavenger two dream stealer, which is one of the biggest reasons for Hotship Oasis, um, two Gaunty Lord of luxury, two cartouche of ambition, one appetite for the unnatural one Nissa vital force, one more die young three duress and one lost legacy. So I've been pretty happy with this specific sideboard. The only thing that I thought about changing is trying to fit away. Um, so I've, I have uh, in the past been a big fan of beating the tokens decks. And one of the best way to do, do that is to wrath them during your turn. And I don't actually have Yehenny's expertise in this deck, which is something that I've typically had uh, because I think that the tokens deck is on such a large de decline that it's not worth including that because it's actually not that great in the mono red matchup while it's decent and serviceable i'd rather have more impactful spells and maybe something like lost legacy could come in in that matchup um you have appetite and duress and things like that so you're not you're you're not giving it up but i think that it's not as important as it used to be overall i've been pretty happy with the sideboard um the only things that i am worried about is the the lack of Veraskas in the deck, I, I have really enjoyed this card. I wish that I could play a second one, um, but I do think that the third version Gear Hulk is pretty important right now, as it really allows your deck to be that curve out deck and really punish the decks that don't curve out as well as you. So that's it for this week. This is the deck that I've been trying out in Standard. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment. Um, I, I didn't mention why I don't like Sultai as much as I should have. It's not that I don't like Sultai. I just think that the format is about curving out, and when you have better mana and just the best spot, the best card at every spot in your curve, it's more likely that you're going to win those matches in this specific standard format. So thank you, everybody, and you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you guys all next week.